So um, I noticed your title is VP Accounting and Operations. Tell me, is that more accounting and finance operations, operations in general? How did how do your days look like? It's accounting, it's operational accounting, but then it's also sales operations, order management, and commissions. And it's both sides of commissions. It's the accounting side of commissions and it's the actual development of the comp plans. And then within all of that, I also get to do the revenue forecasting, uh, the commissions expense forecasting. I think then the accounting teams become more forward. They, they become less of a cost center, less of a back office thing and more partnership and strategic partner in that. On the other side, I think the accounting teams need to embed themselves that way. I think they need to show that they can have this this forward thinking, this this critical partnership, this path to success, right? If you only see your job as after the fact, and you can't see yourself as being in the forefront of the process and how you might influence others to get to a better outcome, then you're always going to be seen as a cost and you're always going to be seen as back office. Dollars. Dollars. Meaning you work with numbers? Oh, it's so much more than that. Modernization. By streamlining the process. So let's get right down to business. This is The Closers. Welcome, Dante. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So before we jump in and get down to business, I'd love to just get to know you a little bit more, get our audience to get to know you a little bit more as well. So curious if you can explain your role to someone who lived, say, 100 years ago. What would that be? Well, to keep it simple, um, I really kind of focus on three things. Um, my role is about partnering with people to help them do their job in a way that's easiest for them while keeping them within kind of the guidelines of our company, helping to deliver our products, uh, all while making sure the financials are correct. I like it. Nice and straightforward and probably easy to understand, uh, even a hundred years ago, which is great. So one question that I do ask every guest, um, and I, it's interesting, I've gotten so many different responses when asking, is how you refer to the holistic revenue process. Is it order to revenue? Is it quote to cash? Is it something else? I've, you know, I, like I said, I've kind of heard the gamut now. So how do you refer to that process? Yeah, I'm, I'm not creative. It's quote to cash, in my opinion. I uh, <laughs> start with uh, giving the customer a quote and everything kind of ends once you get the cash. And the cash is always going to happen after you've done your revenue recognition and everything else, because in most cases, you're giving customer payment terms, right? So they're net 30. They're going to close the books before that deal is before you get the cash from that deal. So quote to cash has always made sense to me. Again, nice, straightforward. I like it. Okay. So how did you initially get into accounting? Was it a planned career path for you? Was it by accident? How did that happen? Yeah, absolutely not a planned career path for me. <laughs> uh, my dad is a partner or was a partner, retired now from PricewaterhouseCoopers. Okay. And so like any good son, I thought, oh God, I don't want to do accounting. I don't know <laughs> what to do that. Um, so I graduated from LMU uh, with uh, two emphasis, uh, marketing and business law, heavily considered law, uh, heavily decided against it because of the debt related to going into uh, law school. I uh, did marketing for a couple of years, really wasn't what I wanted. Uh, and then my dad got to, you know, use the famous uh, parent line, I told you so. Uh, <laughs> I was only about two courses away from completing my uh, accounting um, emphasis as well. So I went through Santa Clara's CAP program, uh, did that, uh, and then did auditing with PwC after that. Uh, and kind of found that it was exactly what I was looking for. See, I'd always hoped that marketing was going to help me understand kind of how businesses relate to each other and all that stuff. And when I actually got into marketing, it really wasn't, it yeah. was funnel analysis and a little <laughs> bit of sales and some other stuff. Um, but the accounting side of things actually really helped me understand the financials of the business. It really gave me a clear insight into the business as a whole. And ironically, from that platform, it allowed me to understand how businesses that I've worked for in the past are interacting with each other, how they're positioning themselves with their customers, how they're supporting their customers. And it, it was much more dynamic than I thought it was going to be. So, so I, I ended up, uh, I ended up here and I think my dad's happy with that. Um, <laughs> I love it. Every parent needs a good, I told you so card they can pull out every once in a while. <laughs> Makes them feel like they did their job. I like it. <laughs> 
So um, I noticed your title is VP Accounting and Operations. Tell me, is that more accounting and finance operations, operations in general? How did how do your days look like? Yeah, so um, it's kind of a unique role, I think, uh, probably here at Actian. Um, and I'm, I'm lucky to have had it or to have it. Um, and it's provided me with a lot of learning experiences. So uh, it's it's accounting, it's operational accounting, uh, but then it's also sales operations, order management and commissions. Um, and it's both sides of commissions. It's the accounting side of commissions and it's the actual development of the comp plans. Um, and then within all of that, I also get to do the revenue forecasting and then the, commits, uh, the commissions expense forecasting. So. Wow. So you've got a broad range of responsibilities there that fall underneath you. <laughs> yeah. And it's it, honestly, that's what excites me about the role is having a lot of different areas to be involved in and then figuring out what all of that means from a holistic end to end process. Because each one of those things drives something else, right? Sales uh, operations, uh, interacting with the team, the sales team, helping them to structure deals, then flows into order management. Order management then kicks off the commissions and the revenue recognition and the accounting side of things and, and figuring out how to maximize the revenue with the sales folks, keeping them within the guidelines of what we want from the business, uh, but then getting all the accounting um, and, and streamlining that, that uh, you know, process and operations is, it, it, I like it, so... Very holistic, just like your uh, uh, order to cash uh, process that you that you talked about. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about your current work. What has you interested and excited right now at Actian? Yeah, so Actian over the past, uh, well, since I've joined really, has been on a really great growth trajectory. For example, last year, um, year over year, we grew probably about 30%. Wow. So that's, yeah, it's pretty big for us. Um, and so with that uh, focus on growth, it really makes you think about how can you support the business? How are the products that we're coming out with, the next versions, the next iterations? How can I advise the business to grow um, within the guidelines, um, within a framework, I should say, so that you don't have wild, unchecked growth that can lead to financial problems? But how can I advise them to grow within a framework and keep that consistent? Uh, and so that's what like really excites me and keeps me engaged. In fact, one of the new products that we have, uh, new ish, I should say is Avalanche and Avalanche is a, uh, data analytics, um, software it's in the cloud. Um, but it's not a traditional SaaS off as there's consumption customers go in, they run their data, uh, that uses compute hours. What do we do from a revenue recognition standpoint? How do we maximize that revenue? for the company? How do we structure these deals to take as much revenue as we can at the right times? So all of that's really interesting. That's super interesting. And you're getting into so many areas that I know lots of companies are looking at right now. Um, before we dive in a little bit more on that, can you tell us a little bit more about Actian? You know, what is it that Actian does? How can users um, utilize those offerings? You, you had just mentioned Avalanche. What else is, is going on in Actian? Yeah, so Actian really has three main product areas. We have databases, we have data migration, and we have data analytics. And all of our products naturally fit together because we've well developed them for that. <laughs> uh, it has to happen through yeah, acquisitions or anything else, right? Um, so in that, if you're looking for a database for a new app that you're bringing to market, we can help you there. We have several different types of databases that may suit your need. Everything from your traditional database to uh, visual, I figured what they call it, it's a visual relationship database um, and, and a few other things. Uh, or if you're trying to move data from one database to another database or from, you know, servers on-prem to the cloud, we have a data integration tool that can help that. And then if you're trying to figure out what is all this data telling me, how do I ask <laughs> the right questions for this data? How do I dig further into it to see, you know, particular insights from customers or trends or whatever else, that's where our product avalanche can come in and help as well. And the best part about it is you can put it all together and create this kind of suite or platform of products that support whatever you're trying to do within your. So interesting. And I think as accountants, we can all appreciate too, you know, data and the reliability of it, how reliable is it, um, how accessible is it, how complete is it. It's it's just about in everything that we do today. 
Um, so really interesting that you've got this entire company just built around data. Data. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So as um, VP of accounting, what is your unique philosophy or what are some of the things about finance and accounting that you really believe in? Yeah. So there's there's two ways that finance and accounting teams can be looked at within an organization. They can be looked at as a strategic partner or they can be looked at as a cost center. And I frankly hate it when they're looked at as a cost center because I feel like the accounting and finance teams haven't done a good enough job of partnering with leadership to show the real value that they can bring to the table. My philosophy is simple. We sit in a position where we see everything that's going on in the company and we can help to educate and guide the business in a way that maybe other leaders aren't able to simply because they don't have the insight into the data or the access to all the data that we do. And so that's where I really think that the accounting teams and the finance teams um, do themselves a great service is by helping to advise the business, say, hey, look, here are the strategic objectives that we've laid out. Here's what the data is telling us as we you know, march against those objectives. Here's where we're exceeding those objectives. Here's where we're maybe not, not cutting it all the way. And here are the tweaks that we can make to get, right? And so if people think about their role as more advisory and customer service in the accounting side, Um, I think it helps to bring them more to the forefront of the conversation. Then you're less reactive on the back end, and then you don't have to jump through hoops on processes or trying to justify the accounting to get to the place that you should have started in the first place. Yeah, you know, and I think you bring up a really interesting point that accounting leaders and and the accounting team really are the the glue, if if you will, at a company because it is really the one area of the business that has a full appreciation for and full visibility across all the different areas. A lot of cross-functional teams may work together, but don't have that same visibility across the entire company. So having that gives not only, I guess, what is it, Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. (laughs) (laughs) You know, having all of the power to see all of those things also um, does hold those teams a little bit more accountable for it. And um, so really a, a, an interesting take um, that you have there. And, you know, curious from, from an Actian perspective, what's, you know, what's on the horizon? What are some of the new things that are coming? Um, what could be opportunities? You know, I heard something around like the consumption piece and curious if maybe that's an area that the company is thinking about that maybe is... Um, maybe a challenge or, or an area for you to partner with? Well, there's, there's two things that I really think um, kind of industry-wide are more on the uptick. Uh, consumption base is uh, probably situationally unique to the particular product, and that has its own sets of challenges, which I'll, I'll get into in a second, in ways that you should think about that. But the thing that I think right now is, is going to happen more in the software industry especially as people are trying to figure out, uh, do I want to be all the way in the cloud? Do I want to be on premise? Do I want to have some mix of that? Um, mm-hmm. I, I think it's really going to be, hey, can I take the software that I bought today and use it on premise and then also take those licenses and use it in the cloud? And then the, the accounting teams, the revenue teams, um, the company as a whole is going to have to sit back and think, geez, okay, what is my customer behavior? Mm-hmm. And if I can understand what my customer behavior is going to be with this particular deal, how do I align my deliverables to support them and make them successful while also being able to take credit for our work in the form of revenue, right? You don't <laughs> do all the stuff with customers, sell them all this great stuff, but then never be able to recognize the revenue. You don't exactly. Get <laughs> so, so that's, I think, one of the big things that, that people are going to think through right now, accounting teams as a whole. Uh, and so that hybrid model, do I provision both things? How much of the revenue can I take up front if it's, say, a perpetual or term-based license? Uh, how much of that revenue is going to be over time because they're going to have access to the SaaS instance up front, right? Um, so that bifurcation, that's something that the that, that companies are really going to need to think through. It, it's really interesting. And I think it's one of the areas that makes our job or keeps our job interesting. It's not just debits and credits. I think that a lot of folks maybe um, think about. And so it's interesting when you have the opportunity to partner with and bring these things to fruition, um, which is really great. So um, what are some of the big initiatives or top of mind items for you right now and the rest of 
you know, the finance and accounting team. Um, what are some of those things that you're really focused on? Well, we've always, so because of the growth that we've had over the past couple of years, and especially with the introduction of our Avalanche product, uh, what's really taking a little bit more of my time and focus uh, is uh, how do we recognize the revenue from, the, from that Avalanche product? How do we deal with that yes. consumption base, right? Uh, and so one of the things that I think as companies are entering into the market with new products, especially products that are consumption based, uh, you need to have the reporting and the operational system set up first mm -hmm. before you enter the market, right? You can always do it retroactively. Uh, but if the market catches, if their product catches fire and the market really likes what you've done, you're way behind the ball. And now you've opened yourself up to a ton of risk on the financial side of whether or not you can capture the information correctly. How do you prove that out to your auditors? You know, if you're, if you're in kind of the, the uh, incubation stage where you're dealing with VCs, uh, it's a much more exciting story to sit back and say, hey, look, I can show the metrics on this growth versus here's what I think the metrics on that growth are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's really interesting too, because to that point, um, that is a, a, a real forward thinking uh, mentality that you have in putting those systems in place before you go to market with with those offerings. I think too often, a lot of times, like when we get pulled in, for example, um, I don't want to say it's too late, but it's running to catch up. Right. Yep. And so there's something that teams are doing manually for some period of time. But as you said, for for those um, offerings that really take off. How are you going to know, uh, you know, how successful it is? How do you catch up in time? Um, and I think sometimes it leaves a little bit of potentially a lost opportunity there in not being able to have visibility into what's going on. Um, have you ever worked anywhere where that's been the case, where you felt like you were more on the, the catch up side of the house versus being proactive and getting ahead of it? Yeah. So um, not to name a particular company, but a company that yep. I worked at in the past, uh, that was a startup. Um, the financial rigor wasn't there from day one. And so then it was running to catch up. Uh, the company had pretty explosive growth, um, from a stage, uh, so a series B company to a series C company, um, mm -hmm. which was great, um, and exciting and fun, but because the financial rigor wasn't there early on, there was gaps. Uh, and so. Simple gaps too, right? I'm going to roll my deferred revenue balance forward. Oh, wait, this doesn't tie. Why doesn't it tie? Oh, because we were doing things on bookings and not based on revenue. And now mm -hmm. I've got to go dig out this two or $300,000 variance from two or three years ago and then re-roll it through all the financials, right? Okay. And that causes headaches for leadership as well because leadership like, hey, look, we've already presented these numbers to the VCs. It's really annoying to have to go back and rerun the numbers and then they may lose confidence in the financial information that you presented to some of the VCs, right? And that's a very small scale, right? You're dealing with VCs. I'm sure that they have some understanding that this stuff may happen and that's a growing pain. Could you imagine if that was a public company and all of a sudden you've got to go back and deal with a two or $300,000 change in your deferred revenue number? Yeah, that, those restatements are not fun. No. <laughs> we actually help a number of uh, companies with that and it's never a good situation to be in. You definitely want to be ahead of that for sure. Yeah. So what advice around the consumption-based pricing, now that you've kind of been through this, would you give to accounting and finance teams that are starting to think about that consumption model and, and the things that they need to think about? I know it's top of mind for just about all accountants, but having been through it, what are some of those points of advice you would give? Yeah, so there's a couple of, couple of nuances um, as you go through it. Um, First, determining, you know, who are you going to work with? Is it going to be Avalanche? Is it going to be Azure? Is it going to be Google Marketplace? Those all have their own flavor and understanding mm -hmm. what that stuff is. Um, and then understanding kind of your unit cost. Uh, what margin am I trying to make on each one of these, these hours, right? Um, and then it, to step a little bit further back from that, uh, as you sit down and you think about this consumption model, what is the goal of the consumption model? Sometimes people get confused and say, well, it's a SaaS offering, so I should just take this revenue ratably. I don't understand why I have to do this based on these units of accounting and this consumption-based <laughs> model. And so if your, your goal is to maximize kind of even revenue 
in your offering, then you have to go back and say, well, what am I delivering? Maybe you're delivering storage. And there's a piece of that that you can take evenly over time to help kind of build that more traditional SaaS uh, waterfall of revenue. But yep. the consumption piece is always going to be chunky. And if you want to drive consumption, the other side of that isn't just from the accounting side. It isn't just from, hey, let's make sure that we have our systems in place that can report consumption correctly and accurately from our customers on a detailed enough level that I can tie it back to each customer contract, right? Because you may have a single customer, but they may have several different instances or several different starting right. uh, times of, I bought a hundred of these things I'm going to consume. Oh, I've consumed all of them in two weeks. Now I got to buy another 200. And <laughs> yeah. Like water bars. So you got to figure out how to track all of that. Um, but that said, I think the business then also needs to think about, uh, how do they partner either from like maybe a customer success team or whatever else with their customers to say, well, look, I see that you have these 10,000, whatever compute hours that you haven't consumed yet. Help, let me help you figure out, you know, the best way to make you shine. How can we help you, you know, use this stuff, set this stuff up. So those type of monitoring tools and having the, having the company engage with those customers early on uh, in their process could help then drive the revenue, which then might help drive some of the make it more smooth and not so chunky. Great point. And great um, advice to give, because I think, you know, having those very detailed examples is really helpful, I think, to put it into perspective about the types of things that accountants need to be thinking about as we adopt these consumption models. It's definitely a new area that a lot of uh, folks are exploring now. Well, the other thing, too, and, and, and sorry yeah. to jump in on this. Just, yeah, no, please. Topic. Uh, the revenue accountant might sit back and say, oh, geez, I, I see that these, you know, five customers haven't, we're not recognizing any consumption hours with them. This is an opportunity where they can reach out if they've partnered with people in the organization to say, hey, look, you know, customer success rep, here's five accounts that aren't moving. Maybe yeah. this is an opportunity for you to reach out to them and help to drive consumption or to understand why they're not consuming so that as we go to the market, you know, we can, we can address these particular roadblocks. Maybe it's a product issue. Maybe it's an understanding issue, whatever, but that's where the revenue accountant can be more than just, Hey, here's how much revenue we have on consumption. It's looking at the data and saying, geez, these guys haven't done anything in two months. Why is that? Do we know why that is? Again, beyond debits and credits. I love it. So let's talk a little bit about the role of the CAO, Office of the CEO, and how that's changed over, say, the last decade or so. What's your perspective on the role of, let's call it the modern CAO? Yeah. So what's interesting about it is, is this, I think the role of the CAO has, has been elevated and kind of um, broken off from the CFO role over the past 10 years more and more. And why mm -hmm. is that? Well, if you look at the modern CFO role, they're involved in so much more than they previously were, right? Before it was just, hey, what, what are the financials? Are controls in place? Do we have funding? And, what, you know, and, and what's our forecast and how are we doing against that force? So kind of those things. But they're getting so much more involved in, well, what's the product and how are we, you know, partnering with our customers? They, they, they have to partner so much more closely with the CEO and the other leadership folks that I'm not sure they have time for the complexities of, <laughs> the accounting regulations and all the other things. And so there, that's where you have the elevation of the CAO role. And now the CAO, I think is doing part of what the traditional CFO used to do. What are my processes? What are my controls? What's my financial rigor? You know, uh, can I, can I put reporting together? That's going to tie back to the strategies on a month over month or quarter over quarter or year over year basis to show people here's what it is. And I think more than that, the CAO has to look at the uh, new accounting guidance coming out and say, this is how it's going to affect us. And this is how we need to modulate our strategy. Or here's how we, here's how we can, uh, you know, effectively use this new rule to propel our company further forward. It sounds like at Actian, you are all very forward thinking, which I love. Um, makes my heart happy. I know, though, that a number of organizations don't share that same sort of viewpoint or that same sort of um, progressive and proactive type of approach. So what do you think stops accounting leaders from implementing that sort of mentality in their organizations? Do you think it's just general mindset? Do you think it's lack of support from, say, the CFO or lack of resources, lack of funding? Is it something else? 
I think each one of those things could be at play uh, where accounting and finance is more of seen as a back office kind of function. Mm -hmm. And I think seeing accounting and finance as a back office kind of function um, is more of a, an antiquated viewpoint, right? That what do they have to offer the business? What are they going to do to tell me that's going to accelerate our growth or help support our customers or sales reps or whatever? And I think if the, the C-suite leadership can shift their paradigm, shift that mindset and start saying, well, well, what do I not know? What can the finance folks or the accounting folks tell me that I, I might not know myself? Maybe I think I know everything, but maybe I don't. What is the, uh, the avatar, uh, thing? It is hard to fill a cup that is already full. <laughs> cool. so very, very true. Very true. So if we can, if we can, if, if the teams at the, the C-suite can come together and say, Hey, look, there's probably some things that we don't know, even though we're very comfortable in our roles, we're very comfortable working cross-functionally. Um, I think then the accounting teams become more, more forward they they become less of a cost center less of a back office thing and more of a partnership and a strategic partner at that on the other side i think the accounting teams need to embed themselves that way i think they need to show that they can have this this forward thinking this this critical partnership this path to success right if you only see your job as after the fact and you can't see yourself as being in the forefront of the process and how you might influence others to get to a better outcome then you're always going to be seen as a cost and you're always going to be seen as back office. So it's both sides, both sides. They need to show that, that they have insight that they can help drive the business. The business needs to be open to taking that insight and, and bringing them into conversations because they know that they want to help drive growth at the end of the day or drive the strategies of the business at the end of the day and not just be the office of, nope. <laughs> it's so true. A little more give and take. I like it. So. Um, we know that many accounting teams are behind on automation. It's evidenced in um, the state of revenue accounting report that Zora published recently. How do you think about um, automation and accounting? And, and what's your strategy? What do you um, lean towards and really push for? Yeah, so in, in any type of uh, organization, I think the first thing you look at but now I should step back, assuming that you have funding and support for it. <laughs> True. I think the first thing you worked at is process optimization. How can I do more with the folks that I have today? And I think in order to optimize processes, you have to look at software. You have to look at automation. The less that my people have to touch because it's standard, it's consistent. The system can figure that stuff out. The better off you are. Um, when I was uh, working at ServiceNow, one of the things that we developed off the SAP platform was uh, procurement would, uh, enter all the information in the system. We got the system to actually look at the procurement docs that have already been three-way matched, take the certain end dates for like prepaid, prepaid items, and then amortize that stuff out without us having to touch it. Uh, and so what that did is it allowed the, uh, accountant to become more of a reviewer, somebody that's looking at it with a critical eye and less of the doer. So they become kind of a second level of review. And then their manager becomes the third level review and can only only needs to then end up looking at maybe large or critical or tricky type of transaction, right? That's a way that you can use automation to better improve your accounting systems and your controls and get to a better outcome while spending less time. on. So last question, Dante, what's the one accounting trend that you've seen recently that you think would be important to share with all of our audience and our listeners? Yeah. So one of the things a couple of weeks ago that I was reading, and I think it was a PwC article, um, was talking about that there's like a shortage of most things, a global shortage of accountants. Uh, and that this trend, uh, is something that they have noticed, um, less students going into the accounting profession in college which means less accountants coming out. And this becomes a critical risk for companies because now we're lacking the talent that we need to hire to fill these roles. In fact, there are two companies uh, in the past three years that actually got material weaknesses because they could not find the right accounting professional to help them close the books in an accurate manner. So if we start to think about that trend, um, I think there's two things at play. I think one, I think, People going through college now don't understand the impact that they can actually have on an organization. I think there's been all these jokes and all this, this 
talk about accountants being nerdy and back office, right? <laughs> movies, it's always some guy with a pocket protector and glasses and, you know, he's, he's geeking out over an Excel spreadsheet. And while we all geek out over our Excel spreadsheets, I think that maybe perception has started to turn some people off to the profession, not just in the U.S., but it appears to be global. And I think we as accounting professionals need to show that we can actually be uh, strategic partners to the business. And the more that you understand how the books are working and flowing, the better you can be a strategic partner with the company. So it's not exactly like, hey, here's an accounting trend I think we need to worry about. But if, I, if I'm talking to the audience, I'd say, hey, look, reach out to your friends and family and let them know that this profession can be a strategic partner with the business. And if you want to be a valued partner to the C-suite, this is a route to get there. It's so interesting. I got to get that message out that we are not about debits and credits. Although I am an accounting geek at heart, um, I like to think we're all cooler than that. So we definitely have to get the message out there. So everybody share with your friends. Accounting is cool. All right, Dante, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a true pleasure chatting with you, and I look forward to having you back again. Thank you very much. I enjoyed being here. And listeners, my DMs are always open to you. Please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn at mdaigle. Links are in the show notes, and please stay tuned for more episodes and insights for other revenue and accounting leaders to join me. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. This podcast is brought to you by Zora Revenue. Automate revenue recognition for any business model, enabling your teams to reconcile and report on revenue in real time. Listeners, my DMs are always open to you. Please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn at mdaigle, that's E-M-D-A-I-G-L-E, and follow me for insights that help accounting leaders grow in their career, modernize their teams, and ultimately become more influential partners in business. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.